Hi there, and welcome back to 19th Century Art. In this lecture, we're going to explore French caricature and picture stories, picking up from the work of Rudolf Topfer. We see a growing interest in caricature, humor publications, and picture stories in the early 19th century. Le Charavari, or the Great Bombast, or Noise, was the name of a publication that became a daily caricature magazine, published between 1832 and 1837. Early on, Charles Philippon and his brother Gabriel Aubert dominated the caricature press and really created an extraordinary array of humorous caricatures about politicians and life in France at this time. Charles Philippon was getting into trouble very regularly with the government authorities. They resented that he dared to represent the king of France at the time as a shoemaker. And so he was hauled before the court. And in his defense, he said, is it really my fault that somebody happens to look like the king? Uh, anything can be made to look like the king. And in that moment, he procured a piece of paper and a pen and right in court promptly drew a picture of the king, a slightly chubbier, rounded picture of the king, an even more stylized picture of the king, and finally, in the end, a picture of a pear. Now, to anyone in the court, this would have been absolutely scandalous, and he got his desired effect. He, though he was charged for his insulting caricature, this image of the king becoming a pair went viral at the time. And so everyone was talking about this. What makes this doubly insulting is the king here is becoming a pair. The word for pair, pa, slang for calling someone a fathead got his illustration back and published it, and soon everyone was comparing the king to a pear. This kind of caricature was uh, been around for a while. It's called metamorphosis, where you take one image and over a series of steps, transform it into something else. And it's a way of equating disparate elements, but showing how each shares some common feature. Literally anything can be made to look like anything else under the extraordinary talents of J.J. Granville. His actual name was Jean Ignat Isidore Gerard, from, who lived between 1803 and 1847. You see him showing the steps and stages of a metamorphosis from a human head to a frog and how you can distort things in this idea of character, moving in metamorphosis, moving from one representation to another. Granville was an exceptionally talented and ambitious artist who unfortunately died early on from illness probably just from sheer overwork, he had an incredible amount of energy and he did all kinds of caricatures. He early on specialized in sort of social caricatures, revealing people as animal-headed. And this was a fairly common way to caricature people, but it, he did it with such realism. He did it with such attention to detail that the animal heads felt genuinely connected to and relating to their human bodies. He also did a very popular series of prints where flowers were represented in human form. Now, Granville was working in a new popular medium, unlike actual engraving. He was doing what was called wood engraving, which is a far more laborious process uh, and more 
expensive because of the material you're working with is very high quality end grain wood. So it's, you know, requires a really sturdy piece of wood you're working with. And it was one that was very effective because it allowed for the picture to then be published alongside words. This was something that could not be done with lithography or the older simple wood block prints uh, or engravings. Wood engraving was sturdy enough that it could be put inside a block of text, just like it were a block of text itself. So that lent it to speedier reproduction. But as I said, it was something that required a great deal of care and time and planning. Thomas Benwick, a British engraver, popularized this in the early in the 18th century. And though it had been known for some time, the amount of time it took to use these prints made it impractical in the past. But once people had a wood engraving, it became a really valuable resource that could be then used in multiple publications, whereas most engravings and woodblock prints would wear out, and the lithograph had to be printed separately. The wood engraving allowed for this integration of text and images in a really important way that became very useful in quickly publishing things. So Granville's work with wood engraving is really quite exceptional. It's quite hard to tell the difference between wood engraving and an actual engraving because they both uh, build up in cross-hatching very often. But in wood engraving, you can actually show solid black to a degree you cannot do with a metal engraving. So you will actually see some solid black in wood engraving. The book that made J.J. Granville famous was a collection of caricatures called Un Entremont, Another World, from 1844, which he did toward the end of his life. And in this collection of caricatures, he did something really quite remarkable. He took this notion that images have their own logic. And rather than be using pictures to illustrate words, he wanted to create pictures that had no literary referent, meaning they represented things as pictures, that there was no way to translate them into words. And so in this first image from his Entremont caricature, and imagination leave the old tired world of illustration and go into this new world, the other world, where pictures themselves have their own logic. And this is really kind of an extraordinary idea that pictures are not wedded to represent things in words, that they can actually represent things purely from the imagination, and that caricature is not bound by representing actual people. It can be used in ways to express new ideas and feelings that have never been seen before. And so he uses this idea of metamorphosis to create a narrative. So here we see objects transforming themselves. Uh, so we have cups becoming paddles, becoming lobster claws, becoming hands clapping. And we see these characters that are dancing legs, becoming a ballerina, spinning like a top, and then spiraling down around the composition, and the hearts become laurel wreaths, become money showering down. It's all telling us about this uh, highly praised performance of the ballerina, but it's done so in a way that kind of fractures and dissolves the boundaries of each of these elements as it's transforming into and out of uh, one thing into another. It's a very imaginative way of visualizing a picture over a series of transformations. One of my favorite images from Entremont is his symphonies performed in steam by these machines. 
and here these steam-powered musicians are performing instruments and there is in the far lower left corner this hand turning a crank and the title of this piece is the me and not me symphony in c major and it really speaks to this idea of the way machines are connected even remotely by human agency this hand turning the crank but they are in a sense not of the person they are in a sense being done by the machine the machine is the artist and this is a really interesting idea that's coming into focus at this time, the way machines are really dominating artistic creation. Here's another example of J.J. Granville's really imaginative picture storytelling. Here we see a murder take place and how the image of this escape of the murder and the scales of justice become an eye that pursues the murderer into this ocean where he's pursued by these eye fish and he's reaching for salvation at the end. This is a really surreal image and it was very inspiring to the surrealists that look back to J.J. Granville's fantastic creations as a precursor to their own movement which would happen 80 years later. And I think this is a very important thing to remember, that a lot of what we think of as beginning or having their impetus in these art movements, such as surrealism or futurism, they all had their precedent in these very imaginative, popular images that were being generated much earlier. Henri Daumier was a tremendous uh, artist who worked with lithographs and he really brought a lot of expression and energy and dynamism to this new uh, printing technique, lithography. Uh, here we can see the wonderful gestures and energy that Daumier has in his work. And we can see him making fun of the brilliant and uh, adventurous photographer Nadar. We'll talk about his work in photography a little bit later. And here he is in 1862 showing this way in which photography was just sort of taking over Paris. And uh, Nadar was famous for taking cameras up into a balloon and doing aerial photography, first person to do that. But in this, he's making fun of this idea that photography is now being elevated to an art, uh, which is actually just being physically elevated up into the sky. Daumier began his career doing very cutting and very uh, damning caricatures of politicians and here the king showing his insatiable appetite for uh, policies that would directly benefit him and we see him as this massive oaf in this huge chair and all the politicians are running up to feed him the taxpayers largesse in the image of Gargantua, which is a very famous French uh, story. Daumier would get into a lot of trouble and would spend days in prison for his caricature work. And he really excited a great deal of anger at the government for his brutal depictions of corruption and inhumanity. This is perhaps his most powerful image this is not a scene he actually saw, though he presents it as if he were there in the room where this happened. But again, he's taking his artistic imagination and pursuing a brutal attack on ordinary citizens. The soldiers had been ambushed in the street and they rushed up into the apartment where the attack came from and murdered the family that was asleep in the room and so he titles this work very simply the street of transonane april 15 1834 where this happened and the date as the evidence of this attack was so brutal and so 
inhumane we see the father murdered in his nightshirt and the mother and the grandfather all laying in pools of blood crushing the child underneath Henri Daumier was a tremendous caricaturist. He had this powerful ability to find the essence of a person's personality in the lines of their face. And he was forbidden from bringing any actual drawing materials into the French political offices. So instead, he carried a lump of clay with him. And he would do these wonderful, quick ceramic studies of the people in these offices that then he brought back to the office and became the basis for everyone's caricatures of these politicians. And the uh, ceramic originals were from 1832, but these painted bronze replicas really give us uh, a tremendous look at Daumier's exquisite uh, powers of caricature. And during his life, he did over 4,000 lithographs, a thousand drawings, and over 300 paintings. He had a tremendous uh, power to capture the feeling and the emotion of the day. Daumier, after a time, the laws of censorship became so strict, he was forbidden from representing any actual politician or any person of the nobility. And so his caricatures became more about uh, symbolic representations of political conditions, or just pictures of ordinary people going about their lives. Here we see an audience in the theater at a tragedy, and he just became fascinated by the range of faces he could see in people's public and the way they reacted to what they were seeing in the theater. He also generated a character that was called Robert McNair, who had a parody of a low-class person with high-class pretensions. Now, Robert McNair's caricature was based actually on a character that appeared in the stories of Charles Dickens. And Robert McNair became a kind of recurring character in the newspaper talking about these changing class distinctions and someone who's a bit of a huckster and a shyster and a charlatan and how they sort of talk their way into and out of all kinds of problems. Daumier did not care much for Robert McNair, but he was reduced to this kind of comic art because of the extraordinary restrictions put on caricature magazines. Daumier, as I said, practiced a great deal of paintings, and he had a very interesting way of going about this. He often would sculpt in clay first the image in he wanted to explore, and then he would try out a number of different kinds of lighting on the figure, and then he would capture it in paint. So here we can see his sculpture, The Heavy Burden, from 1850 to 1853, and here's the painting based on that ceramic sculpture. We can see the sort of physicality of his paintings and the gesture and the action that has been worked out in the ceramic figure. But he also uses light really brilliantly. So here in the laundress, this woman carrying up the clothing from some rich family across the river. They're bathed in a golden light, and she and her child are, are hard at work. And he had great sympathy for working class people, and he shows this in a way. Daumier was one of the very few caricaturists that actually built a reputation as a fine artist. Many, many caricatures envied Daumier for his ability to move between fine art and caricature, whereas most of them were pigeonholed in one or the other.
here is a great example of Daumier's brilliant way of capturing a gesture, a movement, two actors on stage, the low theatrical light giving them this wonderful drama, and the action of the scene is captured beautifully in his gestures and colors. Gustave Doré was, by all accounts, an extraordinary child prodigy who, at eight years old, pulled off this remarkably realistic depiction of a man holding a pole and placing his foot up on a stone. And you see his treatment of gesture and action has a great understanding of line quality and form at such a young age. He grew up reading the comics of Rudolf Topfer, and he always wanted to make his own. And at a young age, he created a comic paneled caricature of the labors of Hercules from 1847. This is when it was finally published. Gustav Doré had an incredible ability to capture action and gesture and he was willing to do things that Topfer hadn't explored, like showing a figure cutting off from a scene. So we have this animal escaping the clumsy oaf of Hercules with his jackass tail, and he can't quite capture this animal. So the labors of Hercules, while it sounds very heroic, we actually have this sort of bumbling oaf uh, trying to get his way. Now, there have been a lot of artists who had found some success in imitating the imaginative ideas that Topfer set into motion, this sequential story action. And so these were quite common. Unfortunately, this is now some 10, 15 years on since Tom Fur's popularity had been at its peak. And it never really caught on. Doré was trying to revive interest in this kind of comic making. But it didn't really develop into anything that was a massive bestseller. And so he tries again, this time, instead of being locked into individual panels, he wanted to focus more on panels and whole pages. And he created this really silly uh, caricature of a middle-class family on vacation up in the mountains, and their life is just become an absolute tumult and a mess. And we see them hiking and this footprint, uh, the drawing itself has been damaged by their uh, falling down this hill. And we can see the way in which their tomfoolery has, has impacted the very image itself in his displeasures of a pleasure trip in 1850. While incredibly imaginative and clever, it doesn't really pay off for Doré, and he's becoming frustrated. So he spends his own money and creates his most ambitious work yet, and that is the history of Holy Russia from 1854. Now, at this point, we just have the beginning of the Crimean War between France and Russia, and at this time, Gustave Doré thought for sure a parody of Russia would prove quite popular, considering the animosities people felt generally about Russia. And so he decides to create this absolutely crazy, absurd uh, depiction of the history of Holy Russia. And it's really quite a remarkable visual delight, the way he's put together really extraordinary range of images and styles. And in this comic, he's, you can see on the very first page, he says, the history of ancient Russia is dark and impenetrable. And so he has this black panel, or if it's actually really sketchy, we barely know, or it's these animals. So he's shifting styles and ways of telling the story in a way that's really very funny. At one point, he says the history is so boring, he cannot bring himself to actually draw it. So he leaves some panels here for someone who has more energy or interest in this period of Russia's history. And he just leaves that page blank. He also, you can see, 
how he varies the narrative in style and tone. So we have very realistic depictions down in the bottom, uh, and then some very sketchy, broad caricatures. We see characters in silhouette. Uh, these are different ways that he was exploring to try and find uh, visual ways of communicating the humor and the action of this farcical history of Russia. And then one of the more dramatic moments as you're reading this black and white comic is that it turns, you turn the page and you see him depiction of the history of Ivan the Terrible with this splash of red ink. And it's so bold and it's so remarkable. It's like this page is suddenly a bloody mess and that each individual page was splashed with red ink in a different way. It really feels like the violence of this period is really brought to the fore in a very original and imaginative way. The history of Holy Russia, Gustav Dore's most ambitious and extraordinary creative work in visual storytelling was a flop and it crushed him and he was in financial straits even as a young man who had so much talent and so much ambition and wanted so badly to be recognized as a picture storyteller had to give it up he had to go to work he had to make money and he could not bring himself to try to become a fine artist instead he became the most famous illustrator of the day. Book illustration, the best paid job available for an artist. And so he created over 10,000 illustrations, employed at the height of his career some 40 block cutters to cut his drawings into wooden printing blocks. So these are all wood engravings. You can just see the amazing detail that he brought to bear on his compositions and this exquisite technique that he had for rendering exciting and imaginative uh, illustrations for all of the classic works of literature. So he illustrated the complete works of Shakespeare, the entire Bible here, the novel Don Quixote, which we have mentioned before. And so Gustave Doré, while you may see some of his paintings today in museums, really never returned to caricature or picture stories or fine art. And he became an artist that was best known for this illustrative work. And it's kind of, again, sad that he couldn't find a way to make it work, considering he had so much ability and so wonderful an imagination.